So let me briefly introduce uh, John Laird, who doesn't really need an introduction in a bigger conference. So if you say cognitive architecture, you mention SOAR architecture, which he developed uh, with other colleagues, of course, but also a review paper, Langley, Laird, and others. So it's really, for me, an honor to introduce John, and we are looking forward to look at the future of cognitive architectures and the integration with uh, language models. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to give a talk. And I also want to thank Alexi for his tireless commitment to BICA over the years for starting it and then continuing it. And this talk is a reflection or is consistent with his, what he said at, um, earlier to, to this morning, where he talked about where the future of uh, BICA could go. And I come from the cognitive architecture um, world, but I also, you know, have to recognize that we have seen this explosion in capabilities from transformers and large language models. And that's what my talk is about. This is not a research results talk. It's more of a trying to make sense of how we can put these two together. And I wanna thank some of my collaborators. Uh, and I also, this is inspired by, by uh, work of many others that I've been reading throughout the last year or, and two. And also because of all this inspiration, I, uh, with others, uh, decided to uh, schedule a AAAI fall symposium on the integration of cognitive architecture and generative models. That's going to be in two weeks. And uh, there you can see the schedule and uh, what we're gonna be doing at the uh, symposium on these websites. And I'm happy to share these slides with anyone after the talk or let the organizers share them because at the very end, I do have a lot of references you might want to be look at, you might want to look at. So let me start out with what I'm looking for in terms of a goal for AI or a goal for my own research and others, which is general embodied intelligent agents. So these are agents that um, are embodied, they interact with a rich complex dynamic world and they can behave flexibly in real time as a function of that environment. They're autonomous, and this is really important is that they're not kept systems. They're not ones where we are stopping them, reprogramming them, having them learn a little bit, then we reprogram them or whatever. Our goal is to have these systems have an ongoing existence where they have to operate and learn autonomously and potentially work in a social community. They do have goals and they have a lot of different goals. So they're not pre-programmed with just a fixed set of goals, but they can learn and pursue new tasks over time. They have a lot of knowledge in them, and that is one of the things, that one of the promises of large language models, which is something that 10 years ago, I never would have believed was possible. They also have many different capabilities. They don't have just language. They don't just have reasoning, but they can do planning. They can do metacognition. They can reason about the past and the future. So they have all, all the cap cognitive capabilities we find in humans, and they're adaptive to their environment and the tasks that they work on. So they do short-term adaptation, but they also have multiple types of long-term online learning so that they are not just, um, not just um, being trained on a specific task and then they forget about it. They actually modify their behavior over time. And all these capabilities come together in a single system. And that's one of the, I think, to me, that's always been the real challenge. We can go after one or two of these um, capabilities on their own, but trying to get them all together in an autonomous system with an ongoing, um, its own existence has always been a, ch a challenge that we have not yet achieved. So the approach I have taken is based on the cognitive architecture hypothesis developed in part, I would say by Newell and Simon and John Anderson. Um, which is that cognition arises from the integration of first, a fixed set of task independent modules. These are modules that are things like um, learning mechanisms, memories, decision processes. These are not ones that are task specific, but these are what hold knowledge. And so the other part of this is that there's multiple representations and multiple types of knowledge. So in our view of cognitive architecture, there's procedural, semantic, episodic knowledge. There's also modality specific types of knowledge, such as what we use in mental imagery. 
Um, and all this knowledge can be learned online through experience. So I am definitely in line with the previous speaker of what we want to do is have agents that learn th over time and develop their capabilities. Although sometimes we will want to start them. We might want to be able to take advantage of large bodies of knowledge that already exist so that our agents don't have to learn everything from scratch. So some examples of cognitive architectures, um, as already mentioned, the one I've been working on through the years is SOAR, but there's ACTAR, EPIC, LIDA, Sigma, Companion. These are combinations of symbolic processing and numeric processing. There's also some that do combinations of symbolic and neural processing. Clarion is an example, SAIL, SAL, and NeuroSOAR. But there's also just pure, more neuro uh, cognitive architectures and what distinguishes these is they do try to be more complete than what we see in a lot of neural systems such as feed-forward networks. So Spawn and Libra are two that come to mind. So that's the cognitive architecture side and an example is SOAR. So here it has a procedural memory, semantic memory, episodic memory, it has multiple learning mechanisms that feed into those memories. And at the center of it, it has a working memory which contains its current understanding of the situation, which is fed by its perception of the world and other modalities, and then decision-making is causes action. Within this, there's a, a set of cycles that are what's driving the system's behavior. There's a, what we call a decision cycle that is through procedural knowledge, which is making decisions about what deliberative act to perform. Some of those deliberative acts can go and access semantic memory or can retrieve things from ep episodic memory. And, and I should say that the learning is not deliberate. The learning is something that's going on in parallel in the background. And one of the things about this, these kinds of architectures is these different processes are all asynchronous running together in parallel. There's a, also the loop between the interaction of working memory and the outside world. So doing actions in the world, getting feedback from the world, and then through decisions, making other actions. So there's this bigger action interaction with the outside world. Uh, one of the things that we've done over the years is look for commonalities between cognitive architectures. And uh, together with Paul Rosenblum, Christian LeBaire, we came up with this idea of a common model of cognition, which is the unification of multiple architectures. And this is just a schema, a schematic diagram of, of what we see here. Although in the, in the common model, we don't separate episodic and semantic. I sort of feel that was a mistake that we should have keep them separate and there are separate parts to that. One of the surprising things to us was that this kind of approach, this actually these modules and the way they interact turns out to be the best match for brain structure when we look at the dynamics of, and resting brain activity and, try and map it on the brain. If we look at data as to how um, activation moves through the brain, it seems based on comparison to other types of models, this is the best kind of model. So this is where it is definitely brain inspired. But you know that is our approach, but what we've seen is a flood of work on language models. So what are language models? My quick way of saying it is that there are neural net transformers, that's over here, that are pre-trained on massive text corpora to predict the next word. And they can be fine tuned with additional text and reinforcement learning for human feedback. And sometimes they're trained on other modalities. But what's a bit amazing, I find, is this idea of attention-mediated context-based retrieval, that not only do you use, um, say, a prompt to do retrieval, but the system learns what aspects of the prompt should it pay the most attention to. And I think that was what was the, one of the key insights that have led to their pretty amazing behavior. So we do see that as they have a context that does lead to short-term adaptation, but it does not lead to long-term learning. So to me, they have incredible fluency in language. They have surprising abilities that are accessible through these prompts, um, but they also have some weaknesses. So what I tried to do here is talk about the strengths and weaknesses of these two approach. So in cognitive architectures, they're an established approach to goal-driven agents. Um, they don't require custom code for new tasks. They require additional knowledge, and they do integrate multiple types of knowledge, representations, planning, online learning, and they do have efficient real-time reasoning. However, they have limitations. They have limited innate pre-trained knowledge. There's no 
innate language capabilities. They have difficulty capturing general regularities and experience, at least in the components that we have in them today. There are some ability there, but it's not as ubiquitous or as deep as what we have in humans. And they, um, for the most part, don't come with innate perception and motor capabilities. In contrast, large language models do have massive bodies of context-dependent pre-trained knowledge. They have amazing fluency across the broad range of language capabilities. They're continually approved. And this is a funny thing. Because they're so popular, they are continually approved by massive financial investment of tech companies and others. And so we can. this is a wave we can potentially um, ride on that um, for building AI systems. But they do have limitations. They require ad hoc architectures. They have the potential for hallucination. They have no online learning. So I find one of the ironic things is a system that is so based on learning and pre-training itself has no learning. It can use context to adapt, but it doesn't have any memory of its experiences, nor does it change the weights um, while it's performing a task. And there's no ability to reason over different world representations or grounding to perception. And it's also very expensive. So the hypothesis is, is if you look at this, and this is very gross, is that just that, well, these advantages over here help with the limitations here, and these advantages over here help with the limitations there. More deliberately, in terms of if we go from language models, what do they provide to cognitive architectures? They provide a large source of diverse knowledge. They provide transaction between perception to internal um, representations, possibly, and they provide natural language capabilities. The cognitive architecture supports um, reasoning to, re to verify um, the knowledge we get out of large, uh, large language models through multi-step reasoning. They also support interpretation and grounding of responses. They also have, um, can create these internal contexts and prompts to support complex reasoning, retrospection, planning, and metacognition. And they have their own learning mechanisms so that the system can adapt over time. So th that's what the hope is. And what I'm gonna do, but there's, yeah, but there's many challenges. And what I'm gonna do for the rest of the talk is look through potential types of integration of these and they're sort of the obvious ones. So it's not, nothing here is going to bounce out and say, well, I, I would have had trouble thinking of that. But I just think it's worthwhile for us to consider what these pot potential integrations are. And the, I'm talking about online integrations where the language model is being used while an agent is being um, executed within a cognitive architecture. There's other ways of doing offline transfer of information from a language model to cognitive architecture that's not what I'm talking about. So let's go through these one by one. So we're gonna take an existing cognitive architecture and augment it with a large language model. So what does that look like? So here's our generic cognitive architecture. Um, and what we're gonna do is add an ability for it to access a large language model through an API and go out and get access to GPT-3. So the large language model is queried for knowledge with a language-based language prompt. So this system is going to create prompts that are going to be sent there. It's then going to get a response back, and it's going to process it as if it was like a sensor um, from perception. Um, but it can ask for you know facts about the world or, or whatever. And it can then do reasoning over what it gets back and try to decide whether it's correct or not possibly do multiple retrievals, et cetera. The long-term memories are gonna store the information it gets back from the language model. So it will generally move from having to access the language model to getting information directly from its own memory, which greatly speeds up the system and reduces the costs. But there's still challenges. It deals, requires the procedural knowledge for generating the re appropriate response, I mean prompts. It also must translate all of its internal representations if it has an internal question that it wants to ask, that has to be done in language. So how does it translate that into language? And then once it gets to the language, it must translate that language back into its own internal representation. The large language model is, is fixed so that it doesn't change over time. And it is can be expensive to use. So we've done some work with this. And this is in the context of what we call interactive task learning where we have an AI system and we're trying to teach it a new task from scratch. 
So it doesn't know the tasks. We're giving it that information to teach that. And we've done this in the past just with SOAR and taught it a wide variety of games and also mobile robot tasks, such as how to fetch things, how to um, uh, deliver things and things like that. And after teaching, it now knows how to do that task and has permanently changed its long-term memory. We saw that large language models provided an opportunity for replacing a lot of the questions the system would ask of a human about defining the task and just get that directly from the language model. So whenever the system encounters a novel task, it asks the human for the goal that it's trying to achieve and the steps of the task. With a large language model, what we do instead is we prompt GPT-3 to or 4 to generate the goal and the task steps. So for example, if the agent is a little robot, it's in a kitchen, and it's given the task to tidy the kitchen, normally what it would do is ask the human, what are the steps for tidying the kitchen? Um, and in this case, what we do is we have knowledge about how to generate prompts, and this is the prompt we generate. So this is a prompt that is um, a, gives a example of a different task, and then it gives a, the, how what result we want from that task, and the steps. So this is a standard thing you do with language models is you it's sort of this one shot example of what I want. And then we actually give it the task that we actually want it to tell us information about where we fill in the blanks so that everything in green is specific to what we're trying to teach it. And if it was a different task, we would fill it in with different things. But th we fill this in and then to me, at least surprisingly, we get a response that the goal is that the paper is in the trash and the steps to do it are pick up the paper cup and put the paper cup in the trash. And this works, although we often get responses that actually aren't very viable for, for a variety of reasons. Like it might tell us to close the recycling bin when our recycling bin doesn't have a top. It also might tell us to pick up two things when our robot actually only has one arm. So we have to be doing some corrections to that. So we've created um, an algorithm, actually it's procedural knowledge and SOAR that we call STARS, and this is just, I'm not gonna be able to go through it in detail, but it, what it does is it actually does a search of high probability responses using a beam search. So it's actually asking for multiple queries of the language model, it gets many back, and it does a beam search to find the best ones. It analyzes those and repairs them, and it looks for mismatches between what the system says you should do and what's possible to do because of the physical capabilities of the robot and what's in the environment. Um, so for example, and it also just background knowledge it has, like for example, it might tell us to put the paper cup in the dishwasher. Well, we know that we should, the system knows that. And then we select it from the candidates given the context. So with this, what we find by augmenting it is that about 70% of the responses we get from the large language model are not viable, but when we go through this procedure, we achieve 100% task completion and a 70% reduction in the user effort compared to only a human. So with a human, we don't use the language model, we just ask them lots and lots of questions and it leads us through and actually answers it. But this then allows us to uh, do this at 100%. All right, so another possibility is that not doing sort of a knowledge-based thing, but we actually replace perception with a large language model, which is actually not a language model per se, but it's a language model trained on um, images and then how to produce the, the language in working memory. We can also do that on the action side, how to go from internal representations to um, control systems. And we still must pre-train these language models and get data to do it. And we are stuck with whatever capabilities they have. So if suddenly we decide we want to perceive something new, we would have to retrain the language model. And also, of course, we have the time and the cost. So what about non-cognitive architecture language models? I mean, architectures. Well, it turns out there's lots of them. So this is just a par partial list. Here are two surveys that are excellent and going over them. But there's just lots of different kinds of architectures out there that aren't sort of the kind of cognitive architecture I'm talking about there. My claim is it's sort of a simplistic over general claim, but they're specialized to specific tasks. They don't try to be as general as a cognitive architecture in their reasoning and capabilities. They're only going after say planning or, or 
or other specific capabilities. So they don't have the breadth of cognitive architecture capabilities that we see in standard cognitive architectures. But it's possible some of those capabilities could emerge from implicit knowledge in the language model. And that's one of the things we need to investigate. But let me keep going and look at novel cognitive architectures with large language models. So these are where we build a new cognitive architecture because we're gonna do language models. And a, a really fun example of this is the generative agent. This is a, they created agents that exist in this um, pretend simulation world and they are um, all interact. And one of the really interesting things that they did is everything is that all the knowledge is represented as natural language wordless, like sentences. So there's no other kind of representation like there is in SOAR or ACT-R, which is a graph-based symbolic representation or um, even number representation or iconic representation. This is going along with everything is language. Um, it does require perception to produce language and action to take language, and they not only have um, uh, this representation in language of sort of the working memory, but they also have an episodic memory that keeps a list of what they've experienced and they can do reflection over that. So there's a lot of neat capabilities in this and this is sort of the general control flows that they perceive things that goes into the memory stream as language. And then they use the language to retrieve memories from uh, that they've had before. And then they use the large language model to do reflection and planning. And that then finally leads to actions. Um, so uh, they realize a society of agents that do spontaneously interact, coordinate and generate ongoing believable emergent behavior. But there are some challenges. Um, you have to have a domain where it can be all done through language. Um, it is restricted to planning and reflection. There's no verification of the correctness of the language model retrievals and the valuable background knowledge is fixed and it is expensive. So one of the co-authors is Bernstein and this is a quote, Bernstein says running the sim for a day or more costs upwards of a thousand dollars. And that just is like, wow. To me, that's a huge um, expense. But this is a really interesting system and I recommend people look at it. Um, it. It has weaknesses, but it's going in an interesting direction. Another possibility is looking at transformers. So don't think of having something that's pre-trained. Instead, think of using the transformer technology and extend the cognitive architecture with a transformer. So leverage those capabilities for online learning. So put aside what language models do and add a graph transformer to something like SOAR where the experience is going to be of changes to working memory are gonna be used to, trans to train the transformer. So there's something called graph transformers that are able to learn from graphs as opposed to just list of words. So we then retrieve what what um, we, we could still do deliberate retrieval from this or maybe spontaneous, but the key idea is instead of predicting the next word, this transformer is gonna predict the next thought or something like that. Now, there's really challenges is that the representation is not this list of words, but parallel changes to graphs. There's also a question of what initial knowledge does the agent have to sort of bootstrap get the pump going so the transformer can actually learn and is the experience that the agent already for generating, the knowledge it has for generating experience, is that gonna be sufficient that the graph transformer has something to work with to really get started? And it's going to require a lot of resources to keep doing this online training of this. And so that could be very expensive. And I really don't know if it will produce anything useful. This is completely a proposal. So finally, what about novel cognitive architectures that use transformers throughout? So we would build a complete trans a cognitive architecture with transformers at its core, um, and transformers or at least neural networks would be all the way down. No explicit symbolic components like I've been showing for those other approaches, um, the other three approaches. Now, the th thing is, I have no idea how to do this, but I think it's a really worthwhile thing for people to start thinking about is how to integrate other 
neural architectures with transformers to try to create the complete capabilities we see in the more traditional cognitive architectures. So I don't know of existing examples, but places to look for, for inspiration are other neural net architectures that don't explicitly have transformers and ask how can they maybe incorporate them into it. So there's the Spawn system from Chris Eliasmith, Libra from Randy O'Reilly, and these other systems. So I think this is an interesting question. Um, I don't have the answers, and maybe that maybe it's not possible, but I would love to see other people do work in this area. Uh, John, sorry. So a, I don't, a reminder, so you let's have one or two minutes. Stop yeah. right now. And so this is just a summary. And stop and take questions. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. John. Thank you. And if we have questions from the audience, I guess you will get a microphone. So we have one question there. And then you're the second. Uh, hi, John. Thank you very much for the great talk, which exceeded all my expectations, of course. A lot to learn, a lot of ideas. And one particular idea resonated with my own, and please tell me if I got it right. Uh, that large language models uh, can be used as a peripheral device to cognitive architecture, providing uh, senses and actuators in the domain of language. Uh, because they, they can recognize uh, all intentionalities, uh, uh, emotions, and so on, uh, and tr even translate them into numbers, if you will, or any other form of representations. I mean, ChatGPT can do that, just with the right prompt. Uh, what do you think? Um, so, language models can are, you know, are predictors from what they were trained on. So the fact that they were trained on books where people showed emotion, um, and is that means that they have representations of of that from the articles, um, but I don't. I wouldn't say that that's going to be a good model by itself of emotion. I'm not sure if that's where you're going. Um, so I think there's still this question that has been raised by previous speakers as to and other researchers as to um, whether that's sufficient for things like metacognition and emotion. But I do see that it's a peripheral so that you can ask questions about it to look for, for the architecture to learn more about emotions because it does have huge amounts of knowledge um, in it. Uh, so um, I, my bet is that you and I agree on a lot of this, um, but you know, not, me not being there and able to understand this, uh, you know, the preci with precision what your question is makes it this uh, difficult. Yeah, I just okay? want to clarify that, uh, in my view, the model should be in the cognitive architecture, but uh, LLM is just the peripheral device. The language model... The, mo the model for emotions, for example, the model for meta. That's what I would say, yes. yes it's yes, not, yes. It's, you don't get it from the language model. There's, there, um, I would say that there's other plumbing in the cognitive architecture that provides emotion. Thank you. Thank one, you. One last question there, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you. Um, I'm just so uh, I'm being a computational neuroscientist and I have just noticed mapping. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can, oh, good. good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I just noticed uh, mapping to the brain and uh, that really raised my interest. Uh, and uh, I have a problem with um, um, terminology of memory because brain, it's a bit more than just memory. Uh, I mean, the mapping from the cognitive architecture that's mainly based on terminology, possibly just terminology. But uh, could you, uh, and I have um, noticed in this particular conference, a lot of reference to emotions uh, which I believe large language models are not capable of because lacking of neuromodulation mechanisms on the level of the neurons, especially dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. But I noticed that you have reference to the limbic system, and could you give some details about those three guys, noradrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine implementation in your mapping? Thank you very much. So we are at a more abstract level than you are comfortable with. Sorry, I can. I, I we our modeling is at a more 
abstract level than I think you would be comfortable with. Because yes, we're not we're, so we're not modeling uh, yeah, neurons here. or neural circuits, and yeah, so yeah, here. Uh, yeah. instead we're trying to find a mapping between what's going on in this kind of architecture and these different components, and then what we see in activation. So you will not. So I do want. So the common model does not have exactly what you talked about, but one of the things we're very excited about is looking at how to extend it so that it does have. Uh, the types of uh, knowledge and information flow and control flow that you associate with emotion. So you won't see that in our models today, but that's something we see as, as something in the future. Thank you. Uh, but wh do, why don't we just uh, start with extension of model of a neuron with neuromodulation? So... So this is the level that you want to get models at. So I, I, I believe there's regularities at, you know, different time scales, And the time scale of the neuron is great for specific uh, types of modeling. Um, there's um, work recently done on fruit flies of modeling almost all the neurons in a, in a fruit fly. And that's great for the, the very low level time scales. But if we want to model things that are like at 50 milliseconds and above, that, at least so far, um, we haven't been able to develop uh, the, the, number, the number of neurons that takes. Is, is, oh, so Spawn is a good example of something that tries to do what you're, doing, you're talking about, which uses uh, spiking neurons to try to get up to this level of abstraction. And so I would recommend you look at the Spawn architecture and Libra. Um, both of those are ones that are taking the neurophysiology or, or structure much more seriously than what we're trying to do. We're sort of coming from the top down. They're going from the bottom up. And our, always our hope is that we're going to meet in the middle. So thank, thank you very much. For thank that you, question. John. Let's thank the speaker. All right. Thank you, John.